The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The federal budget allocated billions in new money for Canada's military. However, even with all that new spending, we're still well shy of NATO's 2% of GDP benchmark. Tonight, in this increasingly dangerous world, should we spend more on the Canadian Armed Forces? Also, amid flagging recruiting and retention, we'll ask what's needed to bolster morale and the appeal of the military to build a fighting force that reflects the needs and demographics of modern Canada. It's Monday, April 11th, and that's tonight on the agenda. With Ukraine fighting for its very survival and looking desperately for help wherever it can find it, attention here inevitably has turned to Canada's ability to meet our international obligations and our own defense needs. The federal government has pledged to spend a good deal more over the next five years. Billions more, in fact. Is it enough? Or more than enough? Let's ask. In the nation's capital, the former commander of the Canadian Army, Andrew Leslie, who's a retired Canadian Armed Forces Lieutenant General. He's also the former Liberal MP for Orleans or Orléans, depending on what side of the Ontario-Quebec border you're on. Peggy Mason is here. She's the president of the Rideau Institute and former Canadian ambassador for disarmament to the UN. Dave Perry is president of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, an independent foreign policy and defense think tank that has received funding from the Defense Department and Industry. And in Victoria, British Columbia, David Pugliese, journalist at the Ottawa Citizen, who's been reporting on the military for about four decades now. And as I welcome all of you to TVO tonight for this discussion, we want to just put some numbers up to uh, set the table for the discussion to come. So I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osmond. Here we go. Money for the military. The Canadian government promised $6.1 billion over five years in new money for defense, with an additional $1.4 billion spent each year after that. What do we spend on defense in this country? $33.6 billion. That works out to 1.36% of our GDP. That's a long way from two. The latest budget would mean defense spending would account for 1.5% of our GDP by the year 2026. And let's do one more page of this. Having said that, NATO wants member countries, as you know, to get to 2% of their GDP by the year 2024. That means we would need to spend about 30 to 40% more to get there. That's around $17 billion more per year. The last time Canada hit the 2% figure was when Brian Mulroney was Prime Minister. Ten members of NATO meet the 2% goal, including the U.S., the U.K., Poland and Greece. We currently rank 25th out of 30 in NATO membership when it comes to defense spending. The average is 1.76% and we're below that, of course. But we are the sixth largest spender in terms of absolute dollars. All right, let's dive into this. Former heads of the Canadian Forces have been saying for a long time that the military are on the brink of collapse due to a lack of funding. General Leslie, let me get you to start on this. Your uh, former colleague, Vice Admiral Mark Norman, warned, quote, we are rapidly approaching the point where our military is considered irrelevant. Do you sign on to that? I sign on with the idea that the Canadian Forces need an, an urgent injection of funds. And let me try and explain why. First and foremost, the numbers you presented, Steve, though accurate, they also include Veterans Affairs. In terms of the actual defense spending, right now the Armed Forces is 7,000 people short. They need about a billion dollars a year more just to keep the spare parts and the training budgets going. We are the only nation that I can find whose army does not have a ground-based air defense system to protect it from aircraft and drones. Our Carl Gustav anti-tank system was first introduced into service in 1946. 1946. There's no decision made on a medium air ground-based air defense system. There's no decision yet made on warship replacements. There's no decision yet made on submarine replacements. There's no uh, decision made on a maritime patrol aircraft or a family of drones. I could go on. The bottom line is it's kind of like investing in a really nice house but not spending a small amount as compared to the original investment to get the heat going and the lights on. And right now, our Arctic is undefended. Well, would I'm you not say... saying we have small there. We have nothing. Hmm. 
All right, let me do a quick follow-up. Would you say that the last budget at least paid to put the lights on? No. I'll tell you why. Because if you give $8 billion over five years, but in the previous seven years, you haven't let D&D spend $12 billion, about $2 billion per year that it was supposed to get, that's a delta of $4 billion. On top of that, it came with strings. A whole bunch of that was supposed to go to the renewal of the North American Air Defense Agreement, which alone is going to probably cost $10 billion. Oh, and by the way, it's supposed to do Arctic defense. And I, newsflash, it's going to cost an awful lot more than $1.5 or $1.6 billion to get a proper Arctic defense going. And let's not forget the Russian bears just on the other side of the ice cap. Hmm. All right, David Pugliese, what do you think about what the general just had to say? Well, it's, it's the same thing that I've been hearing for the last 40 years. Uh, you know, I've written stories in the 90s or close to collapse, um, you know, 2000s, the early 2000s. Now we've got this this same cycle going. Uh, you know, retired uh, defense chief Rick Hillier said there isn't any fuel for uh, for our ships. So there's all, every ship is tied up. Well, I checked with the Defense Department. That's total bunk. We have seven warships at sea right now. Um, so so there's always, uh, you know, the department and national defense will always say it needs more money. And there's a lot of a lot of hype that accompanies that, you know, General uh, Leslie uh, mentioned the Carl Gustav. Well, our Carl Gustavs were were bought in the 1980s, but it's not the actual uh, tube, uh, the launcher that is important. It's the ammunition and the Carl Gustav manufacturers are making high tech uh, laser guided uh, laser guided missiles. So it's a quite an effective weapon, for instance. Let me get the other two guests to comment and then I'll get General Leslie to come back in on this. Peggy Mason, whose side on this are you on? Well, uh the, the figures that were shown at the beginning uh, don't, in, don't uh, include the fact that we are halfway through a 10-year increase, a 70% increase over 10 years. Back in 2017, the Liberal government committed to a 70% increase in defence spending over 10 years, which, if you add the new $8 billion that's just been added, amounts to $200 and $66 billion by 2026, 2027. And it means that the defense budget, which at the beginning of this 10 year cycle was 18.9 billion, so just under 19 billion, will be at 41 billion by 2026, 2027. So we're talking about this latest 8 billion being on top of a massive increase that we're only halfway through. And General Leslie talks about this lost 12 billion, which is for the last essentially, um, well, the last five years in the latest report by the, by the Parliamentary Budget Office, but it goes back earlier, DND has been unable to absorb <clears throat> uh, all of the money pledged. And that's because of course, there are so many major equipment programs, complicated uh, equipment procurement programs that take a lot of time, that DND has been unable to spend all of the money. It's been able to spend the bulk of the money that's been pledged, but not all of it. But this is not lost money. One of the things that the Liberals did in 2017 in that defense policy was, was allow that money. The money doesn't lapse. The money stays with the defense. So there's no lost $12 billion. The $12 billion is still there. And as we go through this procurement process, it will be, you know, it will be spent. So um, these are massive increases we're talking about. And the fact that, you know, the retired generals say, oh, you know, we're, we're on the brink of collapse, as David Pugliese said, you know, that's, we, we've heard that refrain over and over and over again. And uh, it's clearly not on the brink of collapse. We have these major, major programs going through, okay. which are going to take to take some time. I know, I know. I can see Andrew Leslie there. He's champing at the bit to get back in, but, but I'm going to ask, beg his indulgence to hang in there for another minute, because Dave Perry, I still want to get you on the original premise of whether or not our military is on the verge of collapse, or is that an exaggeration? What's your view? 
I think that's a significant exaggeration. Um, the, our forces aren't on the verge of collapse. Uh, I do think, though, that there's a, a disconnect in a, in a funding uh, space between what they've been asked to do and what they've been resourced to do um, over the, the uh, last several decades. There's a planned increase, um, but to General Leslie's point uh, and from what Ms. Mason was saying, we haven't been able to get that money out the door. Uh, and while the forces are allowed to basically keep that funding, when they aren't able to spend it in year and it gets reshuffled to a future year, you're getting uh, yesterday's money at tomorrow interest rates and interest rates at the moment are at a, a multi-decade high so that's a, a significant problem uh, and while the Liberals' defense policy in 2017, I, I think on the whole, was quite good and laid out a sound plan for the forces, um, there are funding uh, shortfalls that have emerged since then. And the 2017 plan had a large IOU when it came to continental defense. So moving forward, I think finding the resources to implement on that multi-year effort uh, on continental defense and strengthening our, our ability uh, to defend ourselves against air threats in particular uh, is where the real funding shortfall lies. General Leslie, you got a bunch of people from Missouri here. When it comes to your original comments, what do you want to come back on? Well, I never actually said that they were close to collapse. No, that's and true. Mark Norman said that. that. that and Mark's more than entitled to his opinion. He earned his the hard way, just like I did. Having said all that, the armed forces has great capability in terms of its troops. It has certain uh, technological aspects which are first rate. But now that we have the, the Russian bear rampaging across the plains of Ukraine, slaughtering innocents, literally at the doorstep of, uh, of NATO, the change to the world order is fairly profound. And there's every expectation that the vengeful Russian bear will in some way, shape or form loom as an ever present threat in the horizon for the next couple of decades, if not longer. So it behooves us to prepare now for the worst case scenario, which is war. And like all soldiers who fought in wars, I'm not keen on them. But let's prepare and invest now in a variety of equipment suites, which could better defend or surveil our Arctic, get some basic capabilities for the Army that are dramatically missing, get the new ship program, the new warship program, replacing our very, well, quite old frigates underway, the new supply ships rolling out of the dockyards. And I could go on for some time. All that requires an investment. And by the way, Canada's GDP is the same as Russia's. So yes, when it's a percentage of a larger number, obviously the figure is big. We have resources to pay. We also have international obligations to meet. And quite frankly, as one of the most powerful and wealthiest nations in terms of economy, certainly within NATO, I think it behooves us as a nation who's benefited from the NATO alliance for so long to pull a proportional and fair share. Let me put that to David Pugliese. Russia under Putin has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is a massive threat to the current international rules-based system of the world's countries getting along. Does it, as the general suggests, behoove us to spend more to be prepared for that threat? Well, it disturbs me when I, I, I hear about war, that we could go to war with Russia. If that happens, we're in World War III and we're talking nuclear weapons. And I don't think much of us, uh, uh, many of us are going to last that much longer uh, if, if that takes place. Secondly, uh, with the Ukraine invasion, I think what's happened is Russia has shown that it isn't this mighty force that we've thought they were all along. They can't even do a ground invasion of a, uh, a, a country that's right beside it. They're having supply trouble. Uh, they're having morale issues. Uh, the, the, Russian, the Russian bear is, is shown to be quite weak. They're still killing Ukrainians every day. 100%, but that doesn't mean that they can successfully take on the 30-member uh, 30 nation uh, alliance of NATO. Uh, you've got, when you have all those 30 uh, nations together, that's a formidable force. So yes, they're taking on Ukraine, but it's a whole different matter when they're, when they're going to be facing uh, NATO. Let's get to the, the significant commitment that all NATO countries are supposed to fulfill, and that is, Peggy Mason, the issue of 2% of our gross domestic product being spent on the military. We're a long way from there, even with the increases in the just-released budget of the current Trudeau government. How important do you believe it is for Canada to hit that 2% mark? I, I think the 2% goal is, is, is nonsensical. It's an arbitrary number that suggests that somehow 
uh, which has to be projected out into the future. Um, and doesn't, I mean, the issue is, uh, what are the threats? It's an assessment of the threat, and it's assessment of the various means, wh which can change over time, and an assessment of, of your means and capabilities to respond to those threats, and also looking at non-military measures uh, to respond to the threat. So, um, so, you know, this was a number that the Americans browbeat NATO into accepting as a, you know, as, as, as a goal. And, and I think, I mean, we are the sixth largest contributor uh, military spender in NATO. The countries ahead of us have larger economies. We have obligations in North America mm -hmm. and in Europe. And uh, I think we're meeting those ob obligations. So I, I really reject I really reject the 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 this very very arbitrary um, measure. Dave Perry, uh, what's I your view of the two percent number? So I would agree that it is arbitrary uh, in the sense that uh, I think it would be very difficult to claim that if we only spent 1.99% of GDP, we'd fundamentally not be be measuring up in terms of the level of commitment. But at the same time, it's a, it's a on one sense it's the target the alliance agreed to, um, and we're we are now increasingly alone in the last about a month and a half uh, amongst NATO allies at not actually making a commitment to at least move to a higher level of of uh, expenditures given the strategic environment. Um, so you'll note that the budget that was published last week didn't actually make a commitment to get to 1.5% of GDP. Um, the finance officials in the in the budget and in some stories leaked ahead of time basically said, if you do the arithmetic, we're hoping to get there by year five. Uh, given our track record at actually meeting spending targets in out years, which the, the fifth year would be, I think that's a pretty tenuous uh, signal. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is, is that it, it while it is arbitrary whether or not you're exactly at that level or not, uh, we today are still coasting on some of the coattails of investments that we made when we did spend at that level uh, back in the 1980s. The ships that our sailors are, are, are uh, uh, sailing around in today, um, about half of that fleet uh, was delivered, um, uh, the, the spending was, was going on it when we were spending at that level, and that's when we bought the fighter aircraft that we still have uh, our pilots fl uh, flying. So while there's, in a sense, it is arbitrary, when you spend at that higher threshold, it gives you a, a much sig more significant base of capability to operate from, and, and we are to still today uh, coasting on decades ago investment when we were spending at a higher level. Well, General Leslie, if that number is considered too arbitrary, let's just consider our reputation in general. Uh, we know the old expression, walk softly and carry a big stick. The Canadian academic Dennis Stair says Canadian foreign policy is more akin to speak loudly and carry a bent twig. What do you think our <laughs> reputation among NATO is these days? Um, I think the... People who actually serve in the Canadian Armed Forces still enjoy a stellar reputation for their individual attributes and skills, but I do know that uh, we are not held in the same high regard that we have been over previous decades. I think there's a great and growing frustration with government vis-a-vis -vis their wise and profound pronouncements and lengthy speeches, but in terms of action, not so much. For example, uh, switching to peacekeeping uh, Canada has about 50 peacekeepers, that's a five and a zero, uh, deployed over the course of the last year uh, in terms of an annual deployment. So we've got 50 people overseas serving under a Blue Beret. That's about the size of a medium school bus. We have about 1,000 dedicated to NATO, uh, which is far lower than it ever used to be. And now that the Russian bears rampaging and slaughtering Ukraine, as our Ukraine citizens, it would certainly behoove us to step up our game and perhaps deploy, forward deploy elements to Latvia, where we have most of the five or 600, to give them an increasing sense of security and to be there just in case whatever may happen. And let's not underestimate the Russian bear. Putin is probably not what you and I would consider normal. I think he's a sociopath and it's really difficult to predict what he's gonna do next. By the way, a whole bunch of folk immediately prior to Putin invading the Ukraine, when he had 220,000 troops massed along the border, we're still saying, don't worry, it's a training exercise, nothing bad's gonna happen. How'd that work out? Well, David Pugliese, that's why we as Canadians have to ask the question, I think, if Russia under Putin decided to put submarines into our, our Arctic um, Ocean and come near our shores, what capability would we have uh, to deter that? Well, 
the only capability that uh, that a nation would have to deter that would be nuclear submarines to go under the ice and as well surveillance aircraft and and that type of thing there's a uh, the canadian forces wants to get a submarine program underway but there's estimates of that costing up to 60 billion dollars uh you know australia is going nuclear and they're talking in in figures of 100 billion 170 billion and i don't think that's something you can sell to the canadian public particularly when there's a lot of pressures on the economy and for health care and and that type of thing peggy mason is russia's nosing around in our waters on our northern border something you think we ought to be concerned about well, uh, we certainly uh, need to have as good a surveillance capability as we possibly can so we know what's going on. But I want to come back to a key point here, and that's the changed strategic environment. I mean, there is a huge lesson from what's gone on, what is going on right now. And that is that, uh, and, and, and that leads to the question of when we look at why is NATO, why is NATO not intervening? Why are they not directly intervening to help Ukraine? And the answer is simple is that the, Biden understands extremely well, and Putin signaled this right off the top with his nu nuclear saber rattling, NATO stay out. Uh, he understands, as Russia understands, that there cannot be a conflict, a direct military conflict between two uh, nu nuclear armed, uh, highly nuclear armed adversaries. So that is what the big lesson is. So talking about you know spending a lot more money on defense in the in, in the north there is no there is no defense against uh, nuclear uh, strategic nuclear weapons against intercontinental missiles I mean even uh, e e long range cruise missiles even some of the conventional hypersonic missiles the, the the defense is deterrence and that is what that's the overriding lesson of what is happening right now is that we are seeing in real time that the United States has faced up and realized that all, that all the talking about limited nuclear war fighting and all the talking about having a conventional nuclear war, and that's the argument for more and more spending. Oh, yeah, there's no danger of nuclear weapons confrontation. We can have a conventional war and it won't escalate. Well, all the evidence, of course, all the war gaming suggests exactly the opposite. But clearly, uh, when push comes to shove, and the United States and NATO were faced with the possibility of a direct military engagement with a nuclear armed superpower, they realized that the, that the risk, that the, the risk was catastrophic. And therefore, the lesson is not more and more and more conventional defense spending for weapons that'll never be used, but a very razor sharp focus on what do we need to do to stabilize nuclear, nuclear uh, deterrence. Uh, and, and endless arms racing is just making the situation far and far, far, far more dangerous. General so that's Leslie, the lesson. General Leslie wants to comment on that. Putin wouldn't have attacked the Ukraine unless he thought he could get away with it. Now, the Ukraine is doing an excellent job of killing his tanks and his guns and his soldiers in large numbers. We'll see how it all ends up, but all our sympathies lie with Ukraine. One reason why NATO had no option but to watch and provide support, you know, as they could get away with, is quite frankly, they weren't ready to try any other option because there had been a peace dividend over the last couple of decades. And instead of having a bulwark force along the inter-NATO border, there was nothing there apart from local troops. The United States, bless them, immediately deployed as a signal to Putin, don't go a step further. And obviously, Putin is going to think really hard about doing so. But when we're faced with a national leader such as Putin, who is not rational by yours and my standards, what happens if he does take a poke into the Baltic states, for example? If we don't have conventional forces, that means that NATO would have to resort to the first use of nuclear weapons to stop him, which, by the way, the antecedents of mutual assured destruction posited by gentlemen such as Herman Kahn in his On Thermonuclear War, written in 1960, clearly indicate the thinking of the time which still exists, that in fact, if you don't have conventional forces, it gives the national governments of the West no choice but to do as you suggest, which, by the way, Peggy, is madness. That is absolutely a non sequitur. So if you don't have conventional forces, your government has no options. 
Oh, second I did point. not say no conventional forces. I said ever increasing spending on conventional forces instead of ignoring the real dynamic is the problem. I mean, no, in, at no time did I say, oh, we're going to get rid of conventional forces. Right. And NATO but and the United States has year. massive, massive conventional capacity. And what this conflict has shown, as David Pugliese has pointed out, is just like during the Cold War, Russia's conventional capacity was vastly exaggerated. And we are seeing that in real time. So all of this exaggerated hype about uh, what this terrible war in Ukraine actually demonstrates is really playing on the fears of Canadians. I mean, the suggestion that Russia is going to attack Canada, which means attack North America, which means attack United States. $889 billion a year is their defense Peggy, spending. So, can I get a word in edgewise? You know, these are, these are. Okay, let's let I General Russell come madness. in here. Let's let the General respond. Thank you. So let's just uh, take this one bite at a time, if I may. First of all, I didn't suggest Russia would attack Canada. But let's say, for example, someone who has demonstrated he has no respect for the rules of international law and has already launched a variety of claims against Canada's Arctic territory, decides, you know what, next year with my pretty large fleet of icebreakers and all those new support bases for the military that Russia has recently built within striking distance or supporting distance, I'm going to install 50 new oil wells in those pristine waters of the Arctic. That's not a hostile act per se, and we have nothing with which to intercede. We have no, going back to your point, deterrence forces available. And without deterrence, without some capability to show that the Arctic is actually under our sovereignty, we leave ourselves vulnerable to the irrational state actor. And I'm sure most people, especially the brave citizens of the Ukraine, would agree that someone is bloodthirsty and ruthless as Putin is by no means a rational state actor. Ergo, you do need conventional forces as a deterrence. And by the way, it's only a real deterrent value if they can fight. Okay, I'm going to jump in here, friends, because I want to pursue this issue of whether we have the equipment necessary to do whatever it is we may want to do, depending on which mission uh, of our guests is being followed. And to that end, we collected a bit of a list here from uh, the National Post and Global News who have put the following forward. Our soldiers are apparently using, still, World War II era Browning 9mm handguns as their standard issue sidearm. We've apparently been trying to replace them for more than a decade. We only retired the 114-year-old Lee Enfield rifle from frontline service a few years ago, becoming the last national military in the world to do so. We were apparently, again, using a version of this rifle in the Boer War. That's 100 years ago or more. Canada's Victoria-class submarines were already secondhand when we purchased them in the 1990s. They've been breaking down and barely making it out to sea, and we want to use them into the 2030s. The Sea King helicopters were flying for 55 years before they were replaced. And replacing our fleet of CF-18 fighter aircraft took 12 years. They're now approaching 40 years old. Looks like we're going to go with the F-35s, even though the government said they didn't want to go with the F-35s once upon a time. Okay, Dave Perry... Figure all that out for us, please. Are we in? Um, are we in need of a massive equipment upgrade, in your view? So I think we are. I mean, there are projects to to move and replace uh, everything on that list, uh, as far as I'm aware, other than the submarines. Um, but the point is that we've been underinvesting for about 20 years, so we're making up for lost time, uh, which is putting the onus on spending more today than we would have had to had we kept a more regular and sustained pace of investment, but we didn't. And that's left us in a situation uh, where right now our fighter pilots could be flying literally the same airplane that one of their grandparents could have. Uh, and that uh, that's endemic across the forces in a few areas. Uh, and I think that's why some people have said that we're at the risk of becoming irrelevant, which is, is a di I think, a fundamentally different way of categorizing things than saying that we are on the verge of collapse. When you have 40-year-old equipment, your equipment is several generations of technology out of date. doesn't mean that it can't be uh, moderately effective, but it does mean that it's nothing close to the current state of the art. And it does mean that when, as an example, you're comparing it to things that have been bought in the last five or 10 years, they just don't have the same level of technical capability and they're not as, op not as operationally relevant. So bringing our, their suite of our forces up to, up to par uh, with modern technology and then keeping us on a pace of investment to keep those regularly replaced 
place. So you don't have a future situation where people can uh, be basically using the same kind of a, uh, a weapon that multiple generations of their family could have. David Pugliese, what's your view on that? So you can cherry pick anything you want. And here, I'll give you a, a different list. So we're going to be spending a billion dollars on new trucks. Uh, bids are coming in this year for $5 billion worth of drones. Uh, we have a new armored uh, tactical armored patrol vehicle. Uh, we have a modern fleet of light armored vehicles, some of the best in the world. Uh, I think General Leslie put some of that in motion. And there's new vehicles that are being delivered right now. So uh, as far as that, uh, and as well, we have uh, new uh, search and rescue aircraft coming uh, this summer. So you can cherry pick all you want, but uh, there's a lot of equipment programs going on. And uh, one, of the, one of the main issues, though, is the massive amount of waste on these procurement programs. We've just got a few minutes left here, and I do want to get your view. Uh, we'll see how many we can get in on this. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie said something uh, that got really picked up and uh, sent around the country a few days ago, namely that Canada, quote, is not a military power. She said, rather, we are, quote, good at convening. General Leslie, what did you think when you heard those comments? Uh, to be honest, I winced. Uh, I know uh, Minister Jolie very well. I was her first chief government whip. Uh, of, I take... A great note of the fact that I think two nights later at a symposium in Toronto, she made a point of saying uh, how she valued the Canadian Armed Forces and how the Armed Forces needed more investment. So uh, I think the two sort of cancel each other out. Uh, but the point, I guess, or one of the points, is that there is a public perception that Canada is not that which it was in terms of its military abilities or its willingness to participate on the international stage and help enforce or compliance with international peace and security. By the way, that's one of the fundamental tenets of our foreign policy, I think, because the last time I saw a written foreign policy issued by the federal government was, I think, 20 years ago. So maybe it's time not necessarily for a new defense policy, because I think the one we've got now is okay. We just got to fund it and solve the procurement issues. But what we really need is a foreign policy review, considering all the changes that are imposed on the system by, you know, what's going on or what's happened over the last six weeks. Peggy Mason, I, I do well remember General Rick Hillier when he was chief of the defense staff saying that the, the Army's job is essentially to, to go overseas, find and kill, I think the word he used was the scumbags who were behind the war in Afghanistan. And then there are other views that suggest that uh, the Canadian military is pretty good at convening and doing more social work, if you want to put it that way. Where are you on that continuum? Well, um, I mean, it's in, the quote you're talking about with respect to Rick Hillier, um, and I was involved in the, um, I mean, I was a, uh, external faculty member of Pearson Peacekeeping Center for 13 years and was involved in NATO training for stabilization operations, including Afghanistan and, and, and including when Rick Hillier um, uh, led uh, ISAF 5, and that comment was made with respect to Afghanistan. And look at what happened in Afghanistan. I mean, those of us at the very, from the very beginning were saying it, it, it's not going to end through military means. The Taliban are not going to go away. There has to be a comprehensive uh, peace process, an inclusive peace process, exactly what we called the Taliban to do when they finally took over after 20 years. So really, what the Afghanistan experience demonstrates is that the military has to be a support to an overarching uh, political diplomatic process. And, and in fact, that also applies with respect to Ukraine. Part of the problem here, this has to end through uh, a negotiated deal. Actually, most of the outline of the deal is on the table, but the United States is not supporting it. Uh, so we, we, we might have been able, we probably could have prevented this conflict in the first place, not in the last few weeks before Putin is made, when Putin had made up his mind, but earlier than that, had we really engaged in uh, in the diplomatic uh, track. So we okay, are. So forgive me. So let me so let me jump in here. Forgive me, Peggy. Let me jump in because we're yep. less than a minute to go, and I really want to hear Dave Perry on this as well. Sh should our army be a killing machine, or should it be involved more on the social work side of things, as some people have put it? 
I think it should be involved broadly in support of Canada's national interests, which would include things like being able to to be better positioned to respond to climate disasters in Canada, which they're being called to do, but haven't gotten that as a specific set of taskings. Uh, but if I go back to the minister's point, I mean, I would love for what she's saying about Canada to be a convening power, to be more true. I think that we have become in the last several decades uh, overly uh, parsimonious when it comes to our, our international investment writ large. We should be spending more on all the different elements of Canada's international role in the world, our di diplomatic core as well as our international aid and development. I think we've unfortunately developed across the spectrum of our international engagement uh, a reputation for being rich, uh, which is why the absolute spending uh, is fairly high. But when you express that as a share of our economy, whether or not it's the share of our GDP going to defense or the share of our, our GDP going towards international development, we're rich, but we're cheap. Uh, and we don't actually make proportional investments like a lot of other countries do. And as in several cases, we have committed to do. And that will be the last word for this debate. David Pugliese, Andrew Leslie, Peggy Mason, Dave Perry, really good of, you, of the four of you, rather, to join us here on TVO tonight for a very important and timely debate for our country. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The Canadian Armed Forces have personnel problems. First among them, they're short-staffed by several thousand positions. But it's more than just what a good recruiting drive might solve. How, for instance, do you get women to enlist amid sexual misconduct scandals at the highest levels? With us on what's needed to build morale and a more diverse military, we welcome, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Maya Eichler, Associate Professor and Director of the Centre for Social Innovation and Community Engagement in Military Affairs. She's at Mount St. Vincent University. And in Kingston, Ontario, Christian Leuprecht, Professor at the Royal Military College of Canada and Director of Queen's University's Institute of Intergovernmental Relations, and we're happy to have you two on our program tonight. Let's just set the, dis uh, set the table, rather, for the discussion to come by putting up these graphics. There are approximately 65,000 Canadian Armed Forces members in total. 65,000. That's about 7,600 people short of full strength. And the number goes as high as 10,000 if you take into account training issues. The military is obviously whiter and more male than the rest of society's workforce. The military says it's 71% white male. By comparison, white males are 39% of the civilian workforce. Just 16% of the Canadian Armed Forces members are female. Now, from the years 2021 to 22, 15% of all new recruits into the regular forces were women. 15%. This was the lowest ever recorded since 2015-16, and it was a drop of 10% from the previous year. What's the target? Well, the military would like to see the armed forces be 25% female by the year 2026. Okay, um, Maya, maybe get us started here. There's a whole bunch of issues to consider. Sexual assault scandals, uh, recruitment troubles, uh, pandemic burnout. We could add that to the list. Do you believe mm -hmm. the Canadian military is currently facing a kind of crisis? No doubt uh, the military finds itself in a very challenging situation. Uh, the pandemic has greatly contributed to that. Um, you know, it has really slowed down the military's ability to bring in new recruits and train them. Uh, a secondary factor is, uh, as well, the sexual misconduct crisis that you mentioned. Um, but I think, you know, whenever we talk about these issues and we talk about challenges, we need to also take a step back um, and ask ourselves, you know, what is the main function, purpose and role of the Canadian Armed Forces um, in society? And I think, you know, we can seize this opportunity to have that broader national conversation. And I was very pleased uh, to see in the recent 2022 budget, a call for a comprehensive defense policy review. So I think whenever we're having these discussions about personnel shortages, the military budget, procurement issues, we need to also have that larger national conversation so that all Canadians can be engaged in these important questions of um, our military. Very good. Christian Leuprecht, what say you on that question of whether the military is facing a crisis of sorts right now? 
Well, I think certainly there is significant challenges on both the staffing side and the equipment side. And it's less a recruitment challenge. Like the Canadian Forces Able to, they bring in about 35 to 65,000 people a year walk through the door and they hire about three, uh, five thousands of those, uh, less in 2021 as a result of the pandemic and training impasses. But there are significant uh, challenges within the training system um, as a result of which the military is 10,000 people short operationally, so it's only operating about 85% of uh, its operational capacity on the mandates and the roles that it has been given. And there are significant challenges. There are some challenges around uh, representation among indigenous members, uh, immigrant communities, visible minorities, but there are significant challenges around uh, the attraction of the organization uh, to women. And there's a host of factors um, involved here. You've mentioned some of those, but some are also just simply issues of there are hundreds of outdated uh, policies, for instance, and procedures in terms of the HR system. We need a much more targeted recruitment effort to specialize. There's about 100 occupations and leadership positions uh, where the Canadian Armed Forces is critically short. So I don't know if we have a macro crisis per se for the organization, but there were sp very specific small crises uh, that add up to a very high risk of of the Canadian Armed Forces in the very near future, uh, possibly not being able to perform for Canadians and for the government of Canada to the extent and to the complexity uh, that it may be called upon. Can I just understand this, Maya? Uh, if there are potentially 10,000 bodies short right now in the Canadian Armed Forces, and many more than that come through the door seeking employment with the Canadian Armed Forces, why are so many people getting turned away? Well, it's not that people are being turned away. I think uh, what we see with the pandemic is that, uh, you know, basic training uh, efforts were were hugely disrupted. So people started basic training, um, and then that process was interrupted, and they had to restart that effort. So we're still seeing the fallout um, from the pandemic uh, of not being able to bring enough people in in a timely manner. All right, let me follow up with you on this. You've described a kind of tug of war over culture that affects the Canadian forces right now. What's that a reference to? So military culture has historically been very exclusionary, right? The military culture is shaped by a history of systemic sexism, gender discrimination, homophobia as part of the LGBTQ purge, uh, as well as racism. And, uh, you know, this has really been going on, this tug of war that I talk about for the last 30 years. It's just that it's more in the public eye right now. Um, what I see in the military is really some forces and some people trying to maintain that traditional military culture and others really trying to push us to adapt a new, more inclusive, more equitable, uh, more diverse military culture. But of course, there are those in the military who have benefited in the past from this more uh, exclusionary culture. Um, you know, they have benefited, and uh, you know, I'll say who I mean here, male heterosexual, male service members have benefited. Um, and so I think it's also about power in the military. But I think what has changed uh, this time around is that um, there's a broader understanding by the senior leadership that they need to take institutional responsibility for updating the military culture. In the past, it's always been assumed that those who come in who don't fit the stereotypical image of the soldier have to adapt themselves to the culture. Um, but I think what we are seeing now finally is um, some institutional responsibility being taken for the need to create a more diverse and inclusive military culture that can better represent all Canadians. Well, okay, Christian, let me follow up with you on that front because the, the numbers clearly don't reflect the way it is in the rest of society in terms of who gets to participate in the Canadian Armed Forces. A and male heterosexuals have been disproportionate relative to the rest of society in their makeup of the Canadian Forces. That assumes, of course, that everybody wants access to the Canadian Armed Forces in equal numbers. Do we know if, in fact, that is the case, or is it more the case that, in fact, many, many more male heterosexual people want to be soldiers than from other groups in our society? You tell me. I don't know. 
Yeah, Steve, that's a great question to ask. So I think broadly, the Canadian Armed Forces remain an employer of choice. If you look at the number of people who come through the door um, and uh, the, the fact that about 5,000 of those get recruited shows that it is a highly selective process uh, to be admitted into the Canadian Armed Forces. But it's not just, for instance, about the, the sort of nuances that I've laid out when it comes to women, for instance. We know that some ethnic groups feel have long felt much more attracted to the Canadian Armed Forces than other other ethnic groups. We know that the Kenyan forces, for instance, have very little representation in, the, in, in large urban centers, and that many of the Canadians that live in large urban centers have virtually no familiarity with working for the federal government, let alone with the Kenyan armed forces. And so if you're not familiar, you're also not going to think of it uh, as an opportunity for you to pursue as a prospective uh, as a prospective career. But I think, as Maya also sort of pointed out, there are interesting nuances within the organization when it comes to culture. So not only are there recruitment challenges, there are retention challenges. So we know that, for instance, we have a disproportionate number of members who identify with underrepresented groups who attrit early, so who release early after one or two deployments uh, because they feel they didn't get the opportunities they wanted, they feel discriminated against, they felt harassed, they felt there was misconduct involved. So there are also issues on that, on that retention side that we really need to fix in particular, as I say, those junior members who've spent a few years in uh, and who, for one reason or another, become frustrated with the organization or the traditional values that Maya outlines that are often very difficult to reconcile, for instance, with the modern family. And that's where I mean where we need to innovate on the policy side. The problem with innovating on the policy side, if you see a 10,000 people short operationally, you don't have the staff to operate the organization, to sustain and maintain the organization, and to regenerate and re constitute the organization. So it is always a struggle of where do you allocate uh, those skilled resources, in particular those junior officers, so senior captains and majors, as well as the master corporals uh, and, and sergeants. And I think this is really where the fundamental struggle for the organization lies. How do you optimize those extremely scarce resources in terms of staffing and in terms of finances? Well, Maya, you asked right off the top, uh, t you asked us to look into the broader question of what the main function of the military is. So let's do that right now, because as you know, of course, there are critics who say that the Trudeau government is sort of more interested in pursuing social policy objectives with an institution as important to the country as the military at the expense of, let's say, battle readiness or preparation to do some of the very unpleasant work that we ask the military to do in far-flung places around the world. What say you on that? I would say that that's a false juxtaposition. You know, these these are old arguments. Uh, we heard them for many decades. For many decades, the military argued that it could not allow women into combat roles, for example, because it would undermine operational uh, effectiveness. Now we sort of hear the opposite argument, right? Diversity is good for operational effectiveness. I would prefer if we kind of threw out <laughs> entirely that uh, that juxtaposition. I think it's a it's a fact that an institution as vital as the Canadian Armed Forces uh, needs to reflect the, the interests and values of all Canadians. It needs to reflect Canadian society. And I think this goes back to the other thing I mentioned earlier on, uh, and that is that we really need Canadians to be more engaged, not necessarily to say they support the troops and they support more military spending, but they need to be engaged in critical conversations about what this institution is about, what we expect it to do. You know, it is being pulled in many different directions right now. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but I think we really need to have that broader national conversation. And I do hope that a lot of Canadians will be engaged in the national defense policy review that has been announced and not just defense experts and the defense lobby, but really that all Canadians uh, pay attention to this matter. I appreciate that, but uh, let me do a quick follow up with you, and that is the population in the country is, I guess, about 51% female, 49% male. It, do we really expect the Canadian military to be proportionate to the population of the country? In other words, 51% female, 49% male. I mean, do we expect no, that I to don't happen? No, I don't think anyone's talking about proportionate representation, and I don't think the numbers matter that much. But, you know, let's be honest, this is an institution that was historically designed by men for men. It's not a coincidence that women haven't been uh, signing up in huge numbers. 
Um, so it's, I think that's kind of an, an argument that dis detracts us or distract, uh, distracts us, I should say, from the main issue. Uh, and that is really deeper engagement with the institution, what we want from it. Okay, Christian, I'll get you to follow up with this because we know the defense minister, Anita Anand, has said that her, quote, top priority was to make sure everyone in the forces feels safe and protected. And obviously some people are asking the question whether that should be the top priority of our military or should it be to create a battle-ready, battle-hardened force that can go off and do dangerous work for us. What do you think? Well, we know from military sociology that militaries reflect the qualities of their society. And if you look at Canada, Canada is a very high quality society that is highly desirable, not just in terms of for Canadians themselves, but for so many people from around the world. And so if we want to have a high quality military, it means that that military needs to effectively represent the qualities within the Canadian society. The Canadian Armed Forces are the single largest organizational employer in the country. So so it needs to lead and set the gold standard because ultimately this is the benchmark against which all other employers, in particular large employers in the country, need to measure themselves. And I think people have higher expectations on the one hand of civil servants, but especially of members who wear the uniform, that they will conduct themselves beyond reproach. And so I need we need to make sure that the Canadian Armed Forces is indeed uh, an organization that reflects equality of of opportunity for all Canadians, and that is a desirable workplace for all Canadians. And I think one of the disturbing issues is if you look at the trends, for instance, on women, on women applicants, and then the number of women who are admitted into the Canadian Armed Forces, the trend is clearly going in the wrong direction. So irrespective of hard numbers, um, we need to certainly address some of the trend lines. Well, we've got some other hard numbers that we want to share here. And admittedly, these numbers are from a defense survey that is three years old which means that it took place before all of the latest round of sexual impropriety allegations came out uh, against the sen some senior members of the military. So it's, it stands to reason these numbers are actually worse right now. But let's put them on the record anyway. In 2019, only 27.8% of regular forces rated their unit morale as high, less than 3 in 10. In the Army, that fell to 20.4%, 2 in 10. And again, only 35.8% agreed they had, quote, confidence in the leadership of the Canadian Armed Forces. Just a little over a third. Maya, what do you think that says about morale in the, in the forces today? Well, I think morale has definitely been hard hit uh, these last couple of years. Again, the pandemic has contributed to that. I think uh, military members are burnt out, uh, like so many other Canadian workers. And in addition, the sexual misconduct crisis, I think, has also um, further undermined confidence and trust in the institution. And I should say that the Canadian Armed Forces, of course, is an institution where trust is so central to cohesion and to its functioning. And so once you have um, a sense of lack of confidence, a sense of betrayal and moral injury among service members, uh, that is something that's quite difficult to repair, and I think uh, the military leadership will have to work very hard on that. Do you think Minister Anand has made the kind of changes that are necessary to give more women the sense that the military can be a good place to have a career and that people, women will be taken seriously there? So I just want to, uh, if you don't mind, say one thing, because I, I, I guess we often conflate women's integration into the military with sexual misconduct. And I just want your audience members to, to understand that those two things are connected, but they're also separate, right? So sexual misconduct does not only impact women, as we saw from the recent class action lawsuit, the Hader BD class action lawsuit uh, that was settled in 2019. Uh, we saw that over 40% of the more than 19,000 claimants who came forward were men. Uh, so I just want to say that sexual misconduct is a broader issue than just women. Um, and no doubt the military has failed with women's better integration. And this has been a process that's been going on since uh, 1989, when the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ordered the military to fully integrate all women. Um, and you know, we have, the military has never really tackled this issue. So I think what is what we're seeing now is that Minister Anand and the senior military leadership are for the first time really, really um, heeding that call that they need to do a better job 
at uh, both culture change and women's uh, better integration into the military. Uh, there's a lot of efforts going on right now. So a new organization has been stood up within the military. Uh, it's known as CPCC, which is Chief of Professional Conduct and Culture. And um, what they presented, I think, two or three weeks ago was a really comprehensive set of culture change initiatives that are happening. Um, so I think, you know, lots is going on, uh, certainly not at the speed as we would like to see it happen. Um, but I think, you know, a, a lot more work needs to be done. The one other thing I'll say is that, you know, we should focus less on numbers and focus more on the quality of the military workplace. Um, if women have good experiences in the military, uh, leave the military and can recommend the military to other women, you know, that's really the number one recruitment tool. Christian, do you have a sense about what the Canadian public in general, how it feels about its military these days? Well, so look, in terms of the numbers that you put up, the morale issues, I think, come from the fact that we've had 30 years of uh, understaffing and underfunding relative to the uh, number of missions and the growing complexity of those missions. And so when you're constantly short staffed and you're constantly short on equipment, no surprise that people, uh, that this creates morale problems. The other key issue that you point out in those numbers, the leadership issue is critical within the military because it's the only organization in the country where people sign up for what is known as unlimited liability. So they can be ordered into harm's way and they cannot refuse that order unless they believe that order to be illegal. And so you have to have trust in your leadership. If you don't have that trust, your military is not going to be particularly effective. I do think in terms of your, your question, the Canadian perception is that I think the military is probably the most uh, misunderstood and the most underappreciated organization in the country. And so we have a significant information gap between the organization, what the organization does and how it goes about its business, as well as the challenges that it faces, and how Canadians perceive that organization. And that's where we need uh, not just the military to step up, but also much more systematic political leadership uh, in mediating that gulf. And because it is ultimately uh, a tool of national power, and it is our, our arguably our most important international and foreign policy instrument. Okay, that'll be the last word on this tonight. I want to thank Maya Eichler and Christian Leuprecht for joining us on the agenda this evening. Um, I, I suppose it's appropriate for two guests with German backgrounds for me to say ausgezeichnet and tschüss. Thank you for this. Dankeschön. Schönen Abend. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs>